It originally came up when the original Bushfire CRC was being created. And the industry had been doing some work around that time looking at fatigue management and fatigue management guidelines. And we were focusing on fatigue management purely as being a shift length issue. created quite a bit of consternation around the industry because what we were ignorant of at that stage was the impact of you know, sleep duration, hydration, nutrition, um, all of those factors and how that actually goes to impact upon fatigue. So we started having some conversations at that time in the context of the Bushfire CRC about what research could be done to assist us with answering those questions. A number of senior uh, occupational health and safety managers expressed their concern that researchers would present robust but isolated guidelines that didn't speak to other guidelines. So their challenge to re our research team and others was to develop a, an integrated approach to this problem rather than a series of isolated or siloed research outcomes. So the work that we do here at the Appleton Institute is largely focused on understanding what happens to people when they don't get enough sleep. So if, you, if we think about cognitive ability on the fire ground as being about uh, concentrating, um, vigilance, and then responding appropriately, what's important is that our firefighters are picking up the signals that they need to make the right decisions to keep themselves safe. In the simulation, we had 91 firefighters perform three days of simulated work in various temperature conditions or lengths of time. The base for all of the testing included three days of a circuit of physically demanding tasks that firefighters had already identified that these were the core tasks on the fire ground. Hose dragging, stepping over obstacles while moving a hose from one position to another, raking up debris, the stop-start movements that are fundamental to a clean-up operation and then statically holding a hose in position while you deliver charged water onto a fire front or burning debris. So they did physical tasks, then we took some physiological measures, um, some blood draws and some uh, blood pressure and those sorts of things, and then they did a battery of cognitive tasks. And they did this block of um, physical, physiological and cognitive five times across the day. Um, interspersed with some hydration breaks, meals, etc. At night time, we kitted them out with um, electrodes to measure their sleep and lined them up on their camp stretches and they slept in the classroom as well to mimic um, you know, sleeping on a deployment in a tent or wherever they do. Through the simulation, we found that two days of restricted sleep where firefighters only had three and a half hours of sleep on average did not impair their physical work. It had significant uh, drops in their mental performance. It also increased their stress or their cortisol response beyond that of normal waking levels. But their physical work was maintained. What this tells us is that firefighters were able to pace their efforts, even though they were sleep fatigued, to maintain their physical work output across their shifts. The big finding here is the changes in cognitive performance, the lack of change in physical performance and how we, or agencies, then uh, use that information to design practices that protect people on the fire ground. That is, you've worked this long, you didn't get any sleep, we need to give you a rest, even though you might feel okay. For the study that we've been running, the focus is really for incident management teams. So it's for those people who have a, a greater cognitive load associated with their work and also that the logistics around those um, groups of people are different for um, the firefighters. So the sleep laboratory is a temperature controlled and also light controlled um, environment. So basically we were just looking at um, novel ways. So obviously 
Um, in many industries they use eight hour rosters, but that in, involves needing three rotations of people. Um, and obviously when you have a bushfire emergency, you need as many hands on deck uh, for as much of the time as possible. So we really wanted to say, if we've only got two crews of workers, how can we manage that um, in ways that, that might address the risk? And the centre also has four individual bedrooms and these were used both to do the cognitive testing um, and also this was where participants were wired up um, so that we could monitor their sleep. One thing that we found that was quite striking with the work that had been done previously is a lot of the timing of shifts had always been done in a particular way with no evidence base that we could discern apart from it had always been done in this way. Um, so we were wanting to really look at uh, not just having these shorter, more frequent shifts, but also what's the best timing for them, considering everything that we know about the body clock and the effect that has. We had previously done research on exposures to firefighters at prescribed burns and bushfires, but then we realised once fires sort of extend into urbanised areas, which happen more and more frequently, we don't have a very good understanding of what the addition exposure risk might be to firefighters. Once you reach sort of urbanised areas, you have additional fuels that are available, so you've got structures that are burning, and the plastics or polymeric materials that's in those structures, they release additional toxic elements. So actually the smoke itself becomes more toxic and also the yields of the emissions might be much higher. So the way we approach it this time rather than putting personal monitors on firefighters is using a newly developed um, smoke dispersion model where we basically put the emissions into that and translated those emissions into exposures downwind. Once you have the exposure estimates, we did similar to what we did with the other project, comparing them to occupational exposure standards and see uh, within the mixture of pollutants what the likely health impacts would be. So some of it, like for example, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, you would have asphyxians, so they could impact on your decision making. So that's usually if you're very close to the source. But further away, it's probably like particulate matter and other irritants that's probably still going to be an issue. In a sense, I think the research really provided us with a better understanding of what firefighters are exposed to, what the potential health risks are. And I think it's a really important point to highlight, especially during training firefighters to make them aware of what different smoke components can do to their body and so that they can recognise sort of the symptoms. But the other thing that we're trying to work on too, it's rather than moving a bit away from the firefighters, but it might also provide some information for residents who are sort of trapped in their homes and make them aware too of what they can expect if there's smoke. Because often when you're looking at people, often people say, yeah, I'm always like, I could barely breathe, I could barely see. So it gives them additional information. And I think this project would be really interesting to sort of put that into the context of residents as well and community exposures. Our work practices have been designed based upon a lot of experience over a lot of years and I think there's a lot of innate knowledge that people have built into it. But what we haven't had is the science so that when we see people uh, saying how tired they are because they haven't been able to sleep properly in the accommodation that they've had, we haven't actually been able to unpack, well what does that really mean for us? So it's giving us the opportunity to answer some of those questions so that we know where to target the work that we need to do and where do we target our education more than anything else? Because things like fatigue and hydration and nutrition are not well understood.